Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth, its sacrament, and service, its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve human need, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other and with God. Amen. I'm going to jump right into conspiracy theories. The communities that gather around these belief systems have a lot in common, actually, with religious communities. That's where I begin. By recognizing the connection between sacred myths that capture the imagination and help a people organize their reality in a way that affirms mystery and generates art, poetry, creativity, and reverence and those myths that capture the imagination of a people in toxic ways. And that's what a conspiracy theory does. Not to say that religions never do that. As I understand it, the QAnon conspiracy that has enraptured the imagination of too many Americans is that there's a network of Satan-worshipping pedophiles who hold positions of power in entertainment, business, journalism, media, and of course, the government. These evil people kidnap children for sex trafficking, and they form something called the deep state government. And this deep state government, it's believed, stole the election from Donald Trump, who is their Messiah figure, their savior, the first president who has had the courage and strength to finally stand up to this nefarious network and their demonic global connections. In this system of thought, in this theory, there's a battle going on between forces of good and evil. And there's going to be a great reckoning soon and a massive legal bust and, and a revealing of all of these villains. And then everyone will know that QAnon was right all along. This was the truth and society will enter into this new harmonious era. So you can see how many similarities and parallels there are with religious, my, religious mythologies and teleologies. Of course, because this is so often the case with conspiracy theories for hundreds and hundreds of years and probably longer, it is thought that many of the top architects of this evil, evil cabal are Jewish. 
the banking family, the Rothschilds, and billionaire philanthropist George Soros are often name-checked in these wild theories. Q is the person for whom this conspiracy theory is named, and he or they is the anonymous source who is supposedly in the know about all of this activity. He has uh, infiltrated the network and is sharing all of this information at great risk to himself. One of the best Inauguration Day jokes I heard was when someone suggested that Joe Biden should reveal himself as Q during his first address as president. And someone quipped, that would really unite the nation. It's not a few people who believe all of this. It's hundreds of thousands, including people you know, who may not believe all of it, but they believe segments of it. Groups of people holding strange, strange beliefs in common is nothing new, and it's not surprising to Unitarian Universalists and all those who are attracted to our spirit of inquiry that groupthink is often irrational and even dangerous. Believing things in common in an unquestioning way, with the willingness to continue to believe in something, even when the evidence doesn't hold up to scrutiny, or to fall under the sway of a charismatic guru is not a right or left wing phenomenon. It's a human one. There are also, you will have noticed, liberal fanatics who likewise demonize and destroy institutions, groups, and people while in the grips of their own collective delusion. No one is immune to this. If we want to live in this world with our own madness and the madness that often swirls around us, I think that we have to try to do two things. The first, and perhaps foremost, is that I think we have to make a decision most days to be humble, to get humble. This requires a sense of humor when, and if at all possible, because our species is absurd. And if we're to bear its ridiculous and often awful behaviors, that's going to require us to try to laugh, lest we dissolve in tears and despair and can't get up and get on with our own lives. I suggested that we start with humility because that word, that concept has its roots in the dirt in the earth. Humus is Latin, or humus is Latin for ground, dirt, earth. Earth we are, dust we are, so scripture says, and to dust we shall return. In the end, we all end up sprinkled with that dirt on the casket, or flung to the winds, or interred. As we seek understanding of human motivations and human behaviors, that understanding needs to be grounded in ground, dirt. In other words, when I want to understand the crazy town conspiracies that have captivated tens or th hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of gullible Americans, I can't do that from the lofty heights of a mocking superiority or intellectualism, but from a sincere desire to understand my own species better, including myself. What is our problem? I mean that genuinely in every sense of the term problem. What really are our problems? What, what are our problems that we can't seem to get beyond and need to? Well, I guess the key one is that we're just trying to get through this life. And we make up stories as a way of doing that. Stories bind us. They make meaning. They work on an unconscious level to connect us to the larger project of human existence. Think of the wonderful stories that have done that, of scripture stories, creation myths, folk tales, 
scary but meaningful. Legends of gods and goddesses, ghost stories, family stories. They warm us around a shared hearth fire and they help us integrate our spiritual experiences with our more rational lives of mere events. Conspiracy theories are another form of storytelling that attempt to create meaning and order when ambiguity is intolerable. This is not to sympathize with conspiracy theorists, and it's not to not judge them either, because they are dangerous and I do judge them. But I also want to understand all of us all of this madness. So the se second thing I think we should try to do if we're to cope with this world as it is, is to recognize that madness is extremely common and we are all vulnerable to it. By madness, I do not mean mental illness, which is a clinical category and can be diagnosed and often successfully managed or treated. By madness, I mean the maelstrom of emotion and sensation that takes us out of our regulated states of being, where we maintain the ability to consider various possibilities and perspectives. It takes us out of that frame of mind into a state of almost altered consciousness, where suddenly, and you've been there, we're shrieking at a helpless baby or animal or we're painting our faces red, white, and blue and screaming for blood in a football stadium. Or we're so overtaken with jealousy and need, we drive across the country all night in a diaper to see if our lover is indeed cheating on us. Our madness is often funny. That's why we love those stories. Or often mere, merely humiliating. There again is that word, humus, earth, plummeting us from the heights of rational thought to the dirt where we bruise our knees. And sometimes the madness is devouring. It's a terrible force that leads, leads to crazed violence, overtaking of basic decency. Society is always in the process of trying to temper the inclination for madness. It's domesticating us, and especially women, I might add, channeling our wildness into appropriate outlets, such as scheduled sports, the group catharsis of concerts and the theater, orderly educational systems, traffic lights, and in Massachusetts, roundabouts that break up the road in order to remind us that our vehicles are not an appropriate way to express our will to power and dominance. Religions try to provide ritual containers and strictures by which communities mediate with the gods and the dangers and chaos associated with birth, mating, dying, and the community of the dead. So here we are in a time of massive social change and global transformation. Think of all that the human being has had to absorb in the past several decades. Perhaps most existentially overwhelming, the possibility of planetary annihilation through the nuclear threat. Well, that itself would be enough to create widespread trauma. But in these days, of course, We've had mass communication, the forces of globalization, the slower form of environmental destruction we call climate change. Trauma is how we describe what happens within the mind when reality is psychologically overwhelming. The mind has many coping mechanisms during trauma, all of which are potentially disruptive but all of which have their own internal logic. To say that those who stormed the Capitol on January 6th 
and who embrace conspiracy theories about evil elites trying to steal the election are traumatized may seem to be excusing them. I am not trying to. I'm just making an observation and if not a request to extend compassion to violent insurrectionists, just perhaps prompting us to respect the ways that our human brains are constantly scanning for explanations for their own sense of discomfort and displacement and how our brains will concoct those meanings when none are forthcoming. Whether or not Q is concocting the, his conspiracy theories just to manipulate people politically or really believes them, I don't know. At this point, the effect matters much more than the cause. And I also don't want to suggest that everyone who was there on January 6th is a QAnon conspiracy theorist, but they were very well represented in that population. In a recent lecture, Jungian psychologist and trauma researcher Donald Kalshed said that science is no match for the fear-inspired imagination. And I'll say that again. Science is no match for the fear-inspired imagination. When people's imaginations have been hijacked by fear, he told us, the brain's defense me mechanism is to create a narrative of suspicion paranoia, and grievance. And here are some of Donald Kalshad's words, which I'm paraphrasing from his lecture, and I got a lot out of that lecture. QAnon organizes a frightening, complicated, and conflicted world and generates self-righteous anger. Conspiracy theories provide an alternative reality because objective reality is more than many people can bear and feel. You see, they can't consciously deal with their sense of loss, perhaps societal status, whatever it might be, their fear, their deep sense of shame and failure and humiliation. They can't handle those things. They can't bring them to consciousness. And so the brain creates this um, alternative reality. And conspiracy theories jump in to, to put a framework around that reality and, and fill it in with with details. There's a lot to say about the similarities between the QAnon theories and the widespread belief that COVID-19 is not a real threat, but is a liberal conspiracy to control the population. People are trying to organize reality in a way that manages their fear and anger and misinformation campaigns allow those people to create silos of alternative reality through which they affirm and validate their shared delusion. Is the South Dakota woman who died of COVID, who spent her last breath telling her nurse that she couldn't possibly be dying of this thing because it, it really couldn't be that serious, is she psychotic? Was she psychotic? Or is it rather our culture that is in psychosis? I've gone on for too long. So let me return again to the earth to ground all of this down, hummus. To be human is to struggle to find meaning, patterns, anchors, reasons for the things that happen in our lives and for that which is frightening and bewildering about them. We can never be grounded in reality to the extent that we want to believe that we are no matter how sophisticated, no matter how educated, no matter how intelligent. For we all have partial vision, partial understanding, and understanding that is obscured by cultural conditioning and innate limitations. We are not gods. We are not omniscient. The mind hijacked by fear is susceptible to dangerous delusions and flights of fancy. It is vulnerable to campaigns of misinformation that provide a preferable framework to the fearful that either keeps the person amped up on an adrenaline rage high or reassures by persuading the believer 
that they can handle a truth that other cowards and conformists are too weak to accept. So what drives out that hijacking fear? A wise man once said that it was love. Perfect love casts out fear. While we turn to science, research, fact, and hopefully reliable news sources to organize our own reality, we have to turn and turn back again and ground ourselves in love, humbly, especially in these fearful times when we are just as vulnerable as any other humans to the madness that can so easily overtake the overwhelmed, fearful, and frustrated human mind. It is love, not just science, that will save us. In terms of the pandemic, we still have to wait for the help from science that will relieve the conditions that have caused so much fear. But love, well, that we can do right now. Thank you. 